Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome, we, we worship this day on the second Sunday in Advent, the God who has promised to be with us through all times, through every generation. 
we gather on this day as a congregation that is separated from one another for health reasons. We gather in prayer and in worship of the God who has promised never to depart from us as we gather wherever we gather. We gather a few of us in our sanctuary this day, and many of you may be watching from home or from other places. Know that as we are united in Christ, we are united as a church during this time. As we begin our worship service today, I would remind you of the, the work that continues to be a part of this congregation's ministries and mission. The mitten tree and the angel tree have been placed in the lobby and we are eagerly await your donations of hats, gloves, scarves that can be shared with those who are in need and, and exposed to the cold in our community during this time of the year. The angel tree is available for you to bring in gifts that would be shared with those who are less fortunate. And in this time, in, in this world, there are many more than normal who find themselves struggling to make ends meet. So if you are able, we would welcome your donations of toys and gifts that can be shared with children, especially in, uh, at this Christmas season. If you would drop those donations off at the church uh, during the coming week, if at all possible, because Christmas is, is approaching quickly, we need to make sure that we get these gifts in the hands of these families within the next 10 days or so as well. I would also um, invite you, if you would like to make a donation to flowers for the Christmas season, you can do so by, by sending that donation to the church and indicate that if, if you'd like to make it as a donation in memory of someone or in honor of someone, we will be preparing a list of the, the, the persons who have provided donations along with the, the donation or the, the uh, suggestion that they have placed along with their donation as well. Today we celebrate the sacrament of uh, communion, and if you are watching this at home or if you are, are in another spot, I would invite you to make certain that you have elements available so that you might join in at the, the celebration of this sacrament with, with those of us gathered here. Those of you gathered here in the sanctuary, I hope you had a, an opportunity to pick up one of the pre-packaged element or communion elements and we will share them together. A reminder that the wafer is under the clear cellophane top and the, the juice is under the foil top in those prepackaged elements as well. You have an opportunity as a part of the Presbyterian Church USA to participate in this, this season's Christmas Joy offering. It is an offering that has been received for many, many years and it goes to pro provide assistance to church workers through the Board of Pensions Employee Assistance Program that provides uh, assistance for ministers, for, for others who have, been work, who have been part of our denomination who may from time to time experience extraordinary expenses and uh, things that need to be dealt with or, or that might provide some assistance in, in those ways. The other portion of that is used to support the students who attend our racial ethnic schools uh, that are uh, related to the Presbyterian Church. So if you are able and would like to make a contribution, please note the link that was in this week's e-newsletter, or you can, can certainly uh, request an envelope, or you may, may, on your check, write that you would like to make a contribution to the Christmas joy as you send that into the church as well. Those are the, the events, or those are the things that we know of in terms of the life of our congregation and as we continue our season of preparation during Advent. I invite you to join with me this morning as we join together in our call to worship. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make God's way clear. Lift up every valley, lower every mountain, for the glory of the Lord shall be revealed 
Our opening song this day is the song Comfort, Comfort Ye My People. Faithful God, we confess that we have not led lives of holiness. We suffer from impatience, apathy, and greed. We have not been at peace. We repent of these offenses and turn to you in love. Forgive our iniquity and pardon our sins, that we may walk in righteousness to the glory of your name. Amen. By the mercies of Christ, our sins are forgiven. For salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. Thanks be to God. We'll light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. This is a season of preparation, and so we prepare ourselves for the days. When the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. May the light of this candle inspire us as we wait for the Christ who has promised that where he is, we too will be. Please join me in prayer. God of our salvation, straighten the winding ways of our hearts and smooth out the paths made rough by sin. Keep our conduct blameless Keep our hearts watchful in holiness and bring us to perfection. The good you have begun in us. Amen. Isaiah 40, chapter 1, 
through chapter 11, or verse 11. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cried out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, and every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the Lord of then, then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together, for the mouth of our Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out, and I say, What shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their consistency is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get up to the high mountain of Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God has come with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like shepherd. He will gather the lambs into his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead them to the mother's sheep. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second reading today is from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. We begin, or we continue in this season, hearing the beginning, but it's a beginning that just doesn't seem to comport with what we would want to hear. So I invite you this morning to listen as we read from this first, this oldest of the gospel accounts. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are stories that we long, that we expect to hear at this season of the year. They are timeless stories that we have have heard maybe since our childhood, maybe we became familiar with them when we were in high school or college. There are stories maybe that are still being written that arise out of activities and events that are parts of your daily lives. There is indeed this timelessness associated with those stories, and Christmas is the perfect season in which we remember them. I look forward every season to the animagic version of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the one that I rem- the story and, and the show that I remember from my childhood. I never grow weary when I hear Jimmy Durante narrating and singing about Frosty the Snowman in the, the cartoon version of that story. I anticipate the retelling of the story of Santa Claus in much the same way that I think I did when I was just a child although it's been many, many years since my childhood days came to an end. I eagerly await the chance to tell the narratives of Matthew and Luke on Christmas Eve. I never get tired of hearing the carols of the season. It must be because the timelessness of Christmas stories and the accompanying traditions connect me to the past as well as to the future. There is a timelessness in Scripture that reminds us of the connections that we have. As we hear those stories of the past, we, we hear them and read them in anticipation of today and tomorrow. We are preparing during the season of Advent for an event that has already occurred, but yet we are preparing for what is yet to come. The two passages for this sun, second Sunday in Advent will draw our attention to the events of the past even as we anticipate what lies ahead. Today's readings come each from very hard times in the lives of God's people. The Old Testament reading is written and comes to us from the time of exile. The New Testament reading comes during a time, during a moment in the history of God's people when they find themselves under siege, under occupation by Rome. Isaiah 40 begins a new message to the reader of Isaiah's day. It brings us to a pivotal point in this prophetic book. Now, the first section of Isaiah 
it comprises the first through the 39th chapter. It declares God's judgment on Israel because of their sinfulness. If we were to turn back to the very beginning of Isaiah, right after we read about the call of the prophet, the word of the Lord that is, is given to the prophet to proclaim declares that the cities will lie in waste, the land will be desolate, that the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the empty, emptiness in the midst of the land. And indeed, that is what is taking place. The conquest of the land by Assyria resulted in the captivity and the exile of the people for a period of about 150 years. Some time later, after years and years of exile, of captivity, the voice of a different prophet is, is, is heard. It is the voice of what scholars refer to as Second Isaiah, declaring, as you heard Sandy read this morning, comfort, comfort ye my people. It becomes an altogether different message. No longer is the prophetic voice speaking words of judgment, but now begins to speak words of God's comfort, of God's promise of redemption. It is a message which reminds them of the past while informing them of their future. The people are reminded that the very God who rebuked, the very God who it seems sent them into exile, will also be the God whose mighty arm can mend all that is broken and make right all that has been distorted. There is a righteous ruler coming, we are told in those verses, but before that ruler arrives, the prophet will describe that there will be a forerunner. That forerunner will prepare, will declare and cry out to the people that now is a time to be ready. The message of the forerunner is this. All the harsh, life-threatening conditions of the past the ruggedness of the wilderness and the desert will be tamed, for the future will be filled with joy when those who were exiles are led straight away to their home, and all, all will see God's glory together. That's a timeless message, and I love to hear it, and I can't not hear it, through its connection to music. How many of you today, as you heard Sandy read those verses, couldn't shake the melodies, the music of Handel's Messiah? For the timelessness of that music is connected to our scripture. They become far more than just, I don't know, another seasonal song. They remind me of the, how that promise was fulfilled by the one whose birth we are preparing to celebrate again this year. It's a reminder of the story of God's love told timelessly by other gospel writers from, a place, from, from the place of a stable and a manger, from a Judean hillside as flocks gently and safely grazed from a night sky that was brilliantly illuminated by heavenly messengers and by magi who brought gifts to a newborn king. Those are the timeless stories that I'm accustomed to hearing, much like I would have heard in Handel's rendition of comfort, comfort ye my people. But the Gospel of Mark, the New Testament reading or the Gospel reading appointed for this day, isn't like that. Mark is, as I mentioned before reading it, believed to be the oldest of the written Gospels. Unlike the other accounts, Mark doesn't begin with all the fanfare, with the dazzling displays that accompany the birth narrative. In fact, Mark says nothing about the birth of Jesus. Instead, Mark begins the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. The first individual we encounter in Mark's story is that messenger whom Isaiah had predicted. John the Baptist is the first one we meet because Mark wants his readers to appreciate the connection to the past along with the connection to the future. Mark begins this story by looking to how the story of Jesus follows the words of the prophet. All that follows is, as Matthew or Mark says, just as the prophet said. Then, beginning with the story of John the Baptist, the writer will connect the scriptures of Israel to the proclamation of Jesus as the Messiah. I appreciated the way Christopher Hudson commented about this particular flow, the trajectory that Mark uses. He writes, Mark teaches us to see God by looking to Jesus. But to understand Jesus correctly, Mark looks way back to the prophets. He sees them looking forward in anticipation of God's intervention. So it's as though we're looking backward and forward at the same time. When, when he stands with them and looks, back, looks as they look back, he sees John the Baptist who is also standing in line with him and looking in the same direction. And as Mark looks at John looking at Jesus, Mark's story invites his readers to see themselves in a different light. There is a timelessness to the stories that we read, even when the stories don't include the elements that we might anticipate. There are so many traditions, there are so many stories that we connect to this time of the year. Another of those timeless celebrations of the season is that of gift giving. And we remember how in Matthew's Gospel we read of the Magi, the wise persons who traveled from the East bearing gifts for the Christ child. That tradition of gift giving is likewise connected to the Bible story of God's love for us all. We celebrate the gift of God's Son coming into the world at Christmas as we retell that story of the Magi, as the tradition of gift-giving is extended even into today. It was in 1906 that the writer O. Henry penned the short story titled The Gift of the Magi. And it was a modern retelling, a new way of telling the story of those first gifts. For you see, the gift of the Magi begins with a description of the home of the Dillinghams. It begins with a description of that home at a place and at a time of distress and, well, hard luck. Despite the poverty of their livelihood, O. Henry writes, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham household in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Immediately, almost immediately, we are clued in to the past. We're made aware of the future through a little bit of foreshadowing. For in their devotion to one another, Della cuts and sells her beautiful hair in order to buy a watch fob for Jim, while Jim sells his watch to buy a beautiful set of combs for Della's equally beautiful hair. The biblical story to which we are drawn at Christmas time is the story of such great love for us. It is the story of such great sacrifice for humanity that no matter where we pick up the story, we pick up the timelessness of God's love for us all. The story that O. Henry writes concludes with these words. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. 
They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest. Everywhere they are the wisest. They are the Magi. The story, the timeless stories we know from Scripture, will end with a gift of love that is preceded by a meal that we will share. Today, we will gather at the Lord's table where we will participate in a meal that causes us, well, to look at the past, to hear the words that we are to take and eat, to drink of the cup in remembrance of me, yet eaten so that we might be sustained for the future together. In this meal, we celebrate the greatest of gifts ever given, the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, the embrace of love that knows no end. But what we do here should not and appropriately is not focused just on the past, but pivots, turns our attention toward the future. For the one who died for us is also raised for us and promises to return to us. And so in this season, we prepare for that future. Thanks be to God. Amen.
As we gather at this table, we gather hearing words that we have heard before. We gather hearing an invitation that has been spoken countless times. It is timeless. It reminds us that in every season, at every time, we are invited to come to the table. For this is the joyful feast of the people of God. We are told that they will come and they will sit at table. They will come from east and west, from north and from south. For it is a table prepared for us by our Lord. It is not the table of a particular congregation. It is not the table of a particular denomination. It is a table prepared for us by the one who came that we might have eternal life through the gift of his life and through his resurrection. So as we gather here, may our eyes be opened, our hearts be warmed, may we come to remember and to embrace the presence of our risen Lord, even in our midst, for these are gifts that have been given for us in each and every time. I invite you to join with me in prayer this day. Great Deliverer, how wondrous are your deeds. You created the world and all that is in it with, mighty, with a mighty arm. You parted waters and led your people to liberation. When we were in exile, you gathered us up in your bosom and led us home like a mother sheep. When we were mistreating our own, you sent prophets to set us right. You pulled down the arrogant and lifted up the weak. And when the time was right, you sent Jesus to set us free. So, mighty God, we ask that you would give us the wisdom to order our common life according to your loving purposes, that your glory may be revealed, that all people shall see it together. Give us strength to follow your Son until all have come to repentance and are reconciled by his love. Give us compassion to love our neighbor and patience to care for those in need. As we break this bread, as we drink of this cup, send us again your life-giving spirit. Recharge your promise within us, for we eagerly await our Savior to come again from heaven. As we wait for him to come again, stir up, O God, by your power, and restore us by sending that Spirit to provide us, to infuse us with hope. As we gather this day as your people, we remember the gift of your Son. We remember also the gift of love that he sent to each of us. And we ask that you would hear us now as we join our voices in the prayer that he has taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are told... On the night of Jesus' arrest, while he was in the upper room with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, pouring it out. He said, This cup represents a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So I invite you this day to tear and take the wafer that has been provided and then follow it by drinking the juice that is a part of our kits.
Let us join together in prayer. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of that Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world, and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing song this day is one that is familiar to us during this season. Come, thou long expected Jesus. find ourselves in many ways, like those people of old, by those generations of people who are uncertain of what the future is, uh, of despair over what is actually happening, and worry over what is yet to come. As we know, over the past few weeks and continuing over the next many weeks. We will see surges in infections. They are beginning to affect even this congregation. So lift up one another in prayers. Practice those things that are necessary in order to maintain safety for you and for others around you. And know that even as we lament what we are missing during this timeless season, we have the past to which we can turn, to which we can remember with joy the celebrations and anticipate the future that is yet to unfold. The words of a prophet long ago said, Comfort, comfort ye my people. The words of a modern day prophet say again to you, Comfort. Comfort ye my people. In just a little while, things will change. For the better, I pray and I hope. In the meantime, I encourage you, I implore you to be safe, to take care for each other, to take care for yourselves as well. For we still walk through a bit of fire so, as you go from this place today, go remembering this timeless message. Go remembering that it is in the love of God that you were born. It is by the grace of God in Jesus Christ that you have been redeemed. 
is by the power of God through the Holy Spirit that you are sustained today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.